Well, it's a great pleasure to be here with uh, Maggie Rodford, who, well, let's so face it, you're all really the supremo here, the managing <laughs> director of Airy Dahl, but also a music supervisor, which is part of the reason we're talking to you today. We'll dig into the music supervision aspect in, in a minute or, or so, but just very interested to know how you made an entry into this profession. Where was your starting point? <laughs> um, well, my starting point was training at the BBC. And we did all the live recording of music for Radios 1 and 2, basically. Oh, right. So it, you know, there was orchestral recordings, big band, working with Elton John on in concert. Um, I, it was fantastic. I was there b b before multi-track recording and then for the introduction of multi-track recording, which yeah. was, you know, quite quite sort of innovative at the time, yeah. but an eight-track um, um, analogue recorder was state-of-the-art. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I went to EMI, and uh, EMI had a broadcast programmes company, um, and they were developing the idea of uh, making pre-packaged programmes for independent radio. But mm -hmm. at the time, independent radio was a fledgling media business yeah, um, yeah. and absolutely didn't have the finances to support okay, um, yeah. but through the work that I did at EMI I had the opportunity to work at the studios up at Abbey Road right. and uh, through that got to know the MD there and he in turn introduced me to Air so wow. Air Studios. It's as easy uh, as that. <laughs> <laughs> well it wasn't no. <laughs> but um, so I was, it was at a time when um, Air Adele, which was part of the Air group of companies, mm. were looking to bring on a junior producer. And through the work I'd been doing at EMI, I, had, uh, I actually produced the Everly Brothers story, which went out on BBC Radio One. Yeah. It was the first ever external programme that they took. Um, and Tim Rice introduced it. Yeah. Um, and through that, I'd started doing some more production work, some music production work. Um, and so I applied for the job at Air Adele. Great. And was successful and I've been here yeah. ever since. <laughs> and was it, was it at Air that you really started to investigate the alchemy of, of music and picture as opposed to saying radio? Yes, yes, because so my up upbringing was obviously very much music and radio. Yeah. When I first joined Air Adele, we were really um, based in commercials. And okay. so we had a group of something like eight or nine composers yeah. who were working um, pretty much solidly on commercials all the time. Um, although some of them, um, a couple of them in particular, were, were also doing film and television. Um, and that was absolutely where I started working to picture. And commercials is fantastic training because yeah. you know, lots of different commercials, lots of different styles, different people interpreting them, um, working with di uh, different creative teams. And yeah. at that time, nearly every idea that was being presented to a client was being presented with music as an indication of you know sort of how the idea might get developed so for composers there were lots of demos right and, okay. and they were all paid demos they weren't yeah. free demos they were paid Gosh, demos times have changed um, the times have changed <laughs> yes um uh, but it, it it also meant for composers it was fantastic to yeah. you've got a quick turnaround you had to come up with something and it but it could be very individual um, yeah, yeah quite flavored yeah. yes yeah. um so uh, it was a very, it was a very exciting sort of steep learning curve. Yeah. Um, and through that, one of the composers that we worked very closely with was Stanley Myers, who wrote the music for The Deer Hunter. Oh, right. But he yeah. also did quite a few commercials. Yeah. And I was very lucky to work with him a lot. And uh, he said to me, you know, why don't you do this in film? Because he said, we need people doing what you're doing in the film world. Um, okay. well, I need someone, you know, who's going to help me organise the sessions and yeah, yeah. make sure that everything's in place, make sure the the, uh, the budgeting side's been done. And so he really encouraged me to right. see whether, you know, sort of Airedale might branch into film and television. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, so that, that's how we yeah. we started getting into those areas. Well, you touched on on how music supervision really contains a, a huge number of 
tasks and jobs. Um, before we kind of zoom into any particular area of that, I mean, you, you might get called a, a supervisor or a, a producer. You know, you have a lot of roles. Can you just whiz us through the range, you know, that, that falls under music supervision? Yes, it's, it's kind of, it is very, very broad. And it, it also has different meanings in different countries. Oh, right, uh, okay. just to make I wasn't it even more added complexity. <laughs> so, um, and I think you know that's also also partly budget driven as well. Yeah. So, you know, in Europe, a music supervisor is somebody who it, it should and is capable of handling any aspect of the music except for writing it. Okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but a music supervisor will um, help budget the music in the first instance. So, um, in in a dream world. Um, a, a producer will ask a music supervisor to read a script early on and maybe yeah. form, help form a view of where the budget level should be, you know, is it a script? And, and sometimes having the opportunity of talking with the director as well obviously is ideal, um, but trying to work out, you know, is it a, an idea that will have an orchestral score at, at yeah. it, is it, or is it to be, you know, mainly samples, or is it to be a mixture of both? Yeah. Are the um, issues, you know, is it to be recorded in the UK, um, you know, are there other options that need to be looked at, and really try and make sure that the budget is the right budget for the film. Yeah. And at that point, also look at the source music as well. So, yeah, yeah. you know, be able to advise on suddenly seeing something that's very expensive that's named in the script and being able to say there needs to be a real realistic sum of money or yeah, that needs yeah. to be looked at before it's shot because it might have to be replaced. And that's the sort of ideal beginning point for a music supervisor. It, a, a supervisor doesn't always get to get, come no, in that early. No, I was going to say that ideal world is not <laughs> um, always so the case, is it? But sort of going through the, um, the process beyond that, um, the music supervisor may well be the person who does come in when there is music required on camera and yeah. help um, sort the pre-records. So recording with maybe on-camera actors, um, musicians that then are going to mime when they're on camera. Course, yeah, working, yeah. So working to make sure that everyone's comfortable, they have everything that's needed for the shoot, working with the sound people on the shoot, making sure technically um, there's going to be the right playback with maybe talking with the, the sound mixer about whether the scene needs the actors to have in-ear monitors or whether yeah. it's going to be playback on speakers and it's at that point you've got quite deeply into the script requirements yeah. obviously yeah, sure. um, uh, and then sort of once you're into post-production then it's working very closely um, in terms of the source music you know on if there is music that's required um, to be bought in, yeah. I, and or is the music coming out of the radio? Where is it going to come from? Yeah. Um, it's a diegetic or non-diegetic. Exactly. It's one of those phrases yes. that you hear a lot, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And so <coughs> being able to be, I always think of us being like the music department that a big Hollywood studio would have, and the services that they can offer the film. And you know, the other key one, uh, which some music supervisors get involved with and others don't is the actual choosing of the composer. Yes, so maybe right. you know checking availabilities, talking with the director producer about the the people that they you know they think they might you know be interested in um, sometimes working with the editors in uh, giving them temp music that they can use if they need to yeah, go if they through need to that cut to it, to it. Yeah. rhythmically or for whatever yeah. other reason. Yeah. Um, and you know, certainly from our point of view and my point of view, I always try and encourage a production to engage the composer as early as possible, so yeah. that the composer can be on board, and perhaps there might never be temp music as stuff. Hope yeah. ho hopefully, it is the composer's own music yeah. that yeah. is going to be dubbed into the film. Um, so feels like that's often quite a difficult thing to achieve and like you, you talk about getting the supervisor in early and that it being an ideal situation and certainly when you look at how powerfully music steers and, and you know can control a scene in, in cinema one I mean I'm often surprised at how late 
musical decisions can be left. Yeah. Perhaps not in the high levels that you work. I don't know. I'd be interested to oh, know. No. <laughs> I mean, frighteningly late sometimes. Uh, I yeah. mean, and and not for the right reasons as well. Sometimes I think occasionally producers think that by bringing the composers on early, it's going to cost them more. Right. <laughs> which as isn't the to case. Just spreading. Just spreading the, the work workload. And informing it. Um, yeah. Yes. And it is. It's, as you say, it, for a composer to be on board early, it informs his process or her process. Yeah. Because you know they get a chance to go to the shoot. They're in the cutting room. They're sort of they get to know the director. I mean, yeah. it's it's a relationship which ideally is very close between director and composer. But if you know if it's left very late in the post production for the hiring of the composer, they yeah. have no time to make a relationship with yeah. anyone. Yeah. They've just got to be writing. Yeah. But but then they're kind of writing in a bit of a vacuum at that point because they've not had the chance to be able to get to know the 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 director get to know the film you know inside out and backwards yeah. whereas to be imbued with the whole yes, flavor of yeah. it before yeah and it's also exciting i think most yeah. composers nowadays feel it's great to be involved early cuz you know it, you yeah. you're part of the whole process yeah you are part of a big collaborative machine yeah. and you want to kind of view the other parts of that machine yes. to get a flavor of it yeah i mean clearly you also represent composers um I'm wondering how easy, <laughs> easily you sort of switch hats. I mean, if you're asked to supervise on a, on a film, I mean, to put it fairly straightforwardly, you might be ve you might feel very inclined to use one of your own composers. Do you find any conflicts of interest? I, th <laughs> I, I think as long as we, as we are totally open with everybody all the time, yeah. that uh, uh, every production there is the right composer to be hired at the end of the day. Yeah. Obviously. We hope that it might be one of our composers, but yeah. but we absolutely, if we're hired as music supervisors, then we are working for the film yeah. with our music supervisor hat on, and probably one of the other people in the office will be doing the representation side. Oh, I see. So we're yeah, not yeah. we're not within the same. We're not trying to do one and the same yeah, within the an same individual. Moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, y you know, it's up to us to know who you know to know composers well to know you know composers f with other agents be able to s suggest the right person for the film yeah, and at the end yeah. of the day those things come together and you know when the chemistry's right yeah, and okay. you can't force it so therefore there's no point in thinking that you know it, it's just can't because we're super square peg into no, a, a no. Hole so i think it's you know yes we're in it, it gives us a you know, great position to have the information about what people are looking for, but it's then, you know, putting forward the right person at the right time for the right project. There's other supervisors in other companies um, who also represent composers, but they sometimes work with our people. So yeah, sure. it kind okay. of there's traffic. There's traffic of, yeah. in both ways, yeah. and and I think you know within especially within Europe, um, you know, the business is is quite small in that sense. Yeah. Everyone does know each other. And you know we all want to get the best for the production. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know the composers uh, are aware that you know that they will be being put forward for the right projects. Um, and, but sometimes the right project isn't the one that they would really, really love to have done. They yeah, would. Yeah. It doesn't sure. quite work out. Yeah. <laughs> you are, you're obviously working a lot in the U.S. as well as here. Yes. Um, managing projects across continents must provide its own set of problems or, or at least puzzles to solve. Are there, are, there, are there differences in approach and technique that you need to be mindful of when, you, when you're in the States opposed to here? Or? Um, the principles are all the same. Um, on the supervision side, sometimes with American projects, um, the supervisor is coming up with the ideas and maybe just doing an initial clearance but the sort of back-end paperwork is very often done by a legal department in a studio or an external legal person that they've hired. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, that, that is a sort of a basic difference that we sometimes see. In terms of recordings and the score supervision side, it's really the, the same principles. Um, sometimes the budgets are bigger, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, across the pond. Yeah. Across the pond. Yeah. And, and also, you know, logistically, sometimes it may be recording in the States um, rather than recording here. So, yeah. I, I mean, I've worked quite a lot in New York and in L.A. Um, and, and obviously all, all across Europe as yeah. well. 
I know you're a keen advocate of the UK studios and players, and I want to come on to that uh, soon. You are, I suppose, in some ways, someone who translates something quite difficult, i.e. music, as, a, as something to discuss uh, to a producer and director. Do you feel that there, there's an important role there in, in making musical concepts understood in ways that are very that don't lean heavily on musical vocabulary and jargon, if you like? Um, I think sometimes we're in that position, absolutely. Um, for me, what's always very important once a composer's on board is that the composer has a really good dialogue with the director. Um, and the more direct that is, the better that is. Sure. So at that point, the music supervisor might not be really involved in those discussions going forward unless either party have got any queries. Well, there's a and sort of glitch somewhere. Yes, yeah. and, and yeah. sometimes what can happen is a composer or a director or a producer may call and just say, can you help out on, you know, we, we seem to be going round in circles, yeah. but maybe somebody else coming in and being able to sort of hear what both sides are saying. You, you can see where the musical language has sort of broken down, maybe yeah. broken down. But it, one, once the composer's on board, I, I really always hope that, you know, the composer and director relationship's going to be so strong that yeah. they have, they've developed their own language. Yeah, um, which, which again is, goes back to what you were saying about hoping that that starts early so yes. that that language yeah. can develop and, and become something, you know, usable between the two. Yeah. yeah. And for the, you know, the, in the initial stages in pre-production, it's sometimes very helpful that we, you know, talking with a director producer before they have source music or a composer on board, then being able to talk in a sort of a non-musical language, but understanding what the musical requirements are, yeah, mean yeah. you can understand what the budgeting issues are going to be, but you don't need to, you know, necessarily go through with the director and producer how many every, violins yeah. you're going to have. Every you know? <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd love to just turn specifically towards something that I know you've done a lot of, which is score supervision. So we're really, we're getting to the point where we're on the stage now. We've got music on paper. What is your role there once, once the dots are on the, on the page and what is supervising a score? Um, in the first instance, it's um, understanding the budgeting process, making sure the budget's been done that the producer has the you know the funds available for the expectation yeah. of the of the composer yeah. making sure there isn't a misunderstanding you know in that um, and making sure that it's deliverable um, so that you know the composer has what they feel and want and need yeah. but also the producer's expectations are met that you know, he always envisaged she was going to have a 60-piece orchestra. He's got eight harps instead. Exactly. <laughs> Why? <laughs> yeah. um, so um, part of our role is that. Part of it's logistics, um, helping uh, work out when the studio sessions should be, finding available studios, engineers, putting a team together very often. So yeah. maybe um, putting together, you know, suggesting music editors, uh, engineer, orchestrator, copyist, yeah. um, and again making sure that in those choices th the budget I is going to be sufficient to to make that team what sort of give them what they need. Yeah. And sometimes obviously there are low budget films where there, there's no way you can have a team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and or it's a team of one or two. Something. It's yeah. a team of one or two. And, and then that becomes sort of a logistics thing just sort of trying to help make sure that you know the composer has what they need in a timely fashion because they're not going to have the backup of an orchestrator and you know yeah. uh, assistants and various people to help them get everything ready so you know if suddenly things come in at 24 hours before the session it's physically impossible for one person to turn everything yeah. round yeah, so yeah. sometimes our role is to try and ensure that the composer gets things sufficiently far ahead obviously where there's a team involved there's it generally means there's a little bit more flexibility, yeah. um, but equally with a team, you've got to have enough time for things to pass between the, the various members of the team. Yeah, so yeah. you know whether it's getting the the, the scores uh, or the MIDI out to the orchestrator, but he in then turn has got to get it to the copyist, who's got to get it copied out for a 70, 80 piece orchestra. You 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 need to be aware of of the time scale yeah. of of those things happening. Um, and 
with technology now particularly um, sometimes not the team doesn't necessarily um, all reside in the same continent yeah so you do have situations especially for instance with American films coming and recording in the UK the orchestrators may be in the US um, but your music copyist is here in London and the music editor is traveling between two places because yeah. they're coming over for the scoring sessions so yeah. you, you know there's quite a lot of people to coordinate and or be be available to to help them it, it's very much a role of helping people have the space and the time yeah. and the resources that they need to be able to do their job as well as they possibly can and um, you touched on that uh, the idea that technology dramatically over the years has changed the space and time for people to do things and where they do them and how they do them yeah can you kind of just elaborate a bit more on that on the ways in which technology has altered this process for you um, it, it's massively changed it. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, originally you would have been recording on on magnetic uh, yeah. film stock. Yeah. Over the last 30, 35, 40 years, I guess, um, multi-track recording has been um, available, but originally it was 24-track analog. Yeah. So therefore, um, you, you know, certain choices had to be made, which instruments were going to be combined on which tracks. Um, and before that, you know, in terms of how the composer, the composer would probably be writing on physical paper with mm -hmm. a pen or a pencil, yeah. um, and then maybe sending a, a sort of reduced score to the orchestrator to, to expand. But again, that was on pen and pencil, and every single note was being written out. And then the copyist had to take that from the score and write out every single note for the orchestra. Yeah. So they each had individual parts. I mean, that alone is an enormous amount of writing. Yeah. If uh, Now that is all com computerized. So yeah. we have digital um, notation systems that are used and are very often used, you know, composer starts maybe with MIDI or may input it themselves into the notation package from their MIDI and then send that through to the orchestrator and then that goes as an electronic package to the to the copyist who then yeah. extracts the parts from the same file so yeah. you know it's it's a file that's traveled um, yeah, rather yeah. than people you know physically having to write out I mean we used to on big sessions you'd have bikes going out you know, sending out scores to different copyists in different parts of London and then yeah. bikes collecting all the parts and you might have, you know, if you were left with a very short turnaround time, you might send, you might make a copy of the score and send it out to one copyist who did the strings and someone else who did the woodwind and brass and then, you know, get yeah. the whole back, lock back together. And that all had to be in a legible form for the musicians because that's yeah. what they were going yeah. to read off on the... So, you know, it's changed yeah. massively. And then obviously in terms of the control room end, when you know, we went through 48 track digital for a while, but now we're on Pro Tools. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, you, you don't ever have that conversation these days no. about, well, you know, which instruments are we going to combine onto which track? I mean, because yeah. that's irrelevant. Now, so. well, one, of the, one of the things that makes me imagine is that actually what technology allows people to do if, if they want to is postpone certain decision making uh, which yes. uh, it strikes me that can create quite a, a jam at the end of the process because we get yeah. so used to everything being changeable on the spot you know I spoke to a composer who, who I won't name but he he said he felt that computer, computers had rendered him something of a kind of musical secretary sometimes where a, a director or producer will be so aware that changes can be made very quickly that he'll, he's just sort of sat in front of Pro Tools dragging things in and out and changing. When you've got, you know, scores and bikers going across London, certain decisions get locked earlier on, don't they? I, I think that's absolutely true. I, and it goes all the way into the actual final dub as well because, yeah. you know, 30 years ago we were delivering a final mix on a three-track mag to the dub. Yeah. So, you know, the three track was left, center, right. Yeah. Um, it wasn't, you know, sort of left hand side is violins and yeah. center track is brass and you can mix it how yeah. you want. Now it's absolutely normal that we stem things out. So we put, you know, yeah. strings or, or we put maybe orchestral elements across one set of stems, but then solo instruments and rhythm section or um, programmed uh, percussion because 
you know, the director wants the flexibility that when he's in the dub, on the dub stage, he might feel that actually he wants to have more of that yeah, you know, sort yeah. of um, program sound. And so that decision has got left to yeah, that's another right one to, to the, the end. end of the line. Yeah. Um, and, and it means for the composer um, that you know, how, how they look after their score on the dub stage becomes a little bit more uh, tricky because unless they're sitting there the whole time, yeah. they're giving all of those stems, that information over to a third party. Yeah. Obviously, in many cases, that's a music editor who's working very closely on the project and knows what the composer wanted. Yeah. Um, but um, it's another element that's left now as sort of a final decision right to the very, very, very end. Now, that must make your early experiences of studios hugely valuable because I'm, I'm imagining you're often there at that last... Yes, sometimes. Well, sometimes, at least, yes. there at that last phase. The dub stage, the dub stage is very much the dubbing guys' okay, um, that's their domain. area. Right. Yes, and and <laughs> sometimes we do get asked to go down, but most times the director and you know really wants to, you know that's his time with the dubbing guys, sure, and it's yeah. his final decisions. I suppose yeah, we um, are talking about after the record now, aren't yes, we? So you'd yeah. be there for that. Oh yes, yeah, absolutely. Not, yeah. yeah. I see, yeah. Um, so, I mean, sometimes even composers feel very unwelcome on a dub stage. Wow, okay, yeah, <laughs> sort of hallowed, secret yes. territory. <laughs> um, so, um, other, other productions welcome them with open arms, yeah. but many, you know, will let, let us get on with it. You, you come, to, come to the dub review, come at the end and then yeah. you can hear it, yeah, which is yeah. good. I mean, then at least you get to hear it. So, And then the other part of my role, um, which is with you know some of the comp uh, certain composers is sort of also helping produce on the sessions. Right. So uh, yeah, course, um, yeah. running this in terms of just keeping an eye on um, how much time we're taking on certain cues, where that leaves us in terms of the rest of the schedule, yeah. and also being able to help listen, take notes, um, uh, and the engineers also take really good take notes as well these days too. Yeah. So, um, but you know just really being able to help. It sort of ru it make sure that everything goes smoothly yeah, um, yeah. on the day. Just referring again back to that technology uh, thing, <laughs> we're speaking and will be hosted on the Spitfire Audio website, and they they make a lot of uh, you know very high quality sampled orchestral packages. Has what a producer or director might hope to hear by way of demo really changed over the years? I mean, I'm imagining you know. John Williams might have been able to sit at the piano and say, don't worry, this will sound great when it's orchestrated and there'll be trombones here or whatever, and they'll be like, great, yeah, can't wait. But nowadays I suspect you have to deliver something that already mirrors the kind of instruments you might use mm. in a live record. Has that really changed? It's really changed. Um, when I first started working in the business, absolutely the composer would sit with the director and play the main theme on the piano yeah. or maybe have just recorded something on a or got somebody to come in and record it for them it, then you know they'd perhaps go through where the cues were in the film and say okay in this cue we'll use this melody but you know the yeah. melody will be on f flute this time and in this cue it'll be on oboe and and just talk through you know may maybe talk through it in that way yeah um, Increasingly now, uh, sc scores have to be fully demoed all the way through to really good s samples because otherwise people can't judge what it is that they're listening to. But equally, there's a feeling now that demos have to be really good quality yeah. and that's absolutely the norm. Right. And I suspect there's very few directors that now would, and financiers too, that yeah. would trust the idea that they had not heard the score until yeah. they went in to the to the recording sessions. That's really interesting. I mean, the trust has changed, but also it strikes me that the there's an, a sort of imaginative leap that directors or producers might have made in the past when they're trying to imagine this with an orchestra that they're no longer either no longer inclined to do or able to do even you know because the technologies kind of close that gap. Yeah. Yes, I think it's twofold. I think it's partly trust and part, partly what has become industry norm. Yeah. Um, and there is a slight sadness in the fact that it's become industry norm so mm. that there isn't the trust element. But on the other hand, some composers actually much prefer it because it means 
that the recording sessions are not quite so scary. So right, yeah, it's not such not a sort of leap into yes. the unknown. Um, yeah. So I remember very clearly when Stanley Myers was working on The Deer Hunter, he phoned me up one day and he said, could I come in and do a demo for the film that I'm working on? I said, sure, no problem at all. You know, And he said, I just need to come in with the guitarist. And he said, I, I'm just really str struggling with the director, you know, doesn't like my themes that he's coming up with and he's asked me about a theme that I wrote for another film. The main theme of The Deer Hunter was actually the main theme from a film called The Walking Stick. The director had fallen in love with this theme. Yeah. So Stanley came in and demoed it on guitar with John Williams playing the guitar and that became the main theme right. which we now know as The Deer Hunter. Yeah, and yeah. most you know, obviously the backstory is not so well known, but I mean, they licensed the music and it was, you know, all above board. There's no hiding anything. But there was a situation where Stanley needed to be able to demo it, to show it, yeah, to, that yeah, it was yeah. going to work. I've seen two directors say to a composer um, when they've heard the main theme, OK, I'll see you on the scoring sessions. Wow. And That's quite scary as yes, well as sort of exciting. <laughs> yeah, very scary. Both of them were extremely well known and um, uh, very established directors who came from the world that you hired people and you trusted people, yeah, yeah. you got your theme, you were happy, I'll see you on the sessions. Yeah. But from the composer's point of view, it, that was kind of really, really scary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in, this, in both cases, the composer said, no, no, you're going to hear some more things before that. Yeah, because right. <laughs> yeah, of course so, these days there's a, there are many different ways of entering composition in terms of technique. Yeah. And that's, you know, we talk a lot about the sort of democratisation of music via technology. I'm sure that creates, it's created a whole lot of music, a lot of different music yeah. makers and techniques and irrespective of the quality of that, yeah, you yeah. know, lots of people have never been near a piece of manuscript paper. No. You know. I think, I think there are good things that have come out of demos that, um, and that people now want to hear much more finished demos is that you know, sometimes it helps um, a producer understand that actually this is going to need some orchestral forces. You need a string session. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, finding the finance for that becomes okay. Well, we can hear what it is that we want to achieve. We understand that you know it would be great to have the money for that. Yeah. So there are, you know, there are pluses to it. It's um, but I think it, it's sort of opened people's understanding a little bit, a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but of course, there was a time when a film score would absolutely be automatically an orchestral thing. These mm. days, not the case. And these yeah. days, it could be whether or not guided by finance is a choice. How, when do you find people wanting to lean into full orchestral scores as opposed to, say, something electronic or experimental in other ways? You know, what, what is it they're seeking in, in, in the use of an orchestra? It's hard to generalise because... Yeah. You know, there's pure electronic scores that sound massive and huge and yeah. have, you know, really served the picture well because at the end of the day, mu the music is totally serving the picture. Yeah. yeah. So um, y there are some films where it's an epic story and without an epic score, it would, it would just seem very strange. And you yeah. see the footage and you think, it's got to this, be huge. It's got to be huge. <laughs> yeah. And you probably, in those cases, you read the script and yeah. you, you just know this has to be huge. And there's other films where, you know, it's an intimate story. Actually, a big orchestral score would be totally wrong yeah. because it would demand too much attention. It would be, it would over, overpower the visuals, which are intimate. And what you need is something yeah. that's intimate, that's really going to tug at the heartstrings and sort of keep that one-on-one um, -on -one feeling that you're getting from the dialogue that's happening yeah. on, the, on, on the screen. So, so there's a sort of scale consideration and, you know, and orchestras are some way in that, you know, yes. for, the, for the epics or yep. the large scale. Or and obviously the composers, you know, the choice of composer and the sort of the natural um, way in which the composer normally writes. You know, some composers nearly always write for an orche orchestral yeah. forces. Um, it's, you know, some very much a work between orchestral and electronic, and then there's some some very successful composers working on pure electronic scores. Yeah. But yeah. I guess that's part of the sort of selection process that, you know, people always want to listen to what the composer's done before, yeah. which 
can be very frustrating because you know that the composer could completely nail the brief that they've now yeah. got, but because they want to hear something they've done before, it's yeah. like yeah. really tough to find it. You're as good as your it. last job yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting that, that, that change in uh, the use of orchestral music. I mean, if you follow the Bond movies, for instance, you know, and you go back to, say, Goldeneye, which was a very... It was, it was a, an elect, more electronic yep. score, and then they, they really went back to the orchestral sound. Yep. Do you think, I mean, has, has, has the work of people like Hans Zimmer really helped to kind of, after a certain phase, put orchestral playing back onto film scores where it might have, there might have been a fashion for a while to avoid yeah. that? I think that's probably the case. I mean, Hans and Tom Newman, yeah. some um, you know, well, composers like Patrick Doyle, Daria Marinelli, I mean, they're all composers who, you know, working on contemporary films, but absolutely using orchestra yeah. as their main, you know, sort of main resource. You mentioned two composers there that I did want to talk to you about, and Dario Marinelli, you know, you've clearly, you look down your list of films, he's there a lot, and, and mm -hmm. you've clearly nurtured him in this industry from, from well. the start. I mean, well, <laughs> you, you, may, you may not see it as strongly as that, but can you talk a little bit about how he came to be represented by you and, and how his career was launched with you? I, I actually met Dario first, when um, I was working on a score with Patrick Doyle and Brian Gascoigne, who uh, was playing keyboards, said, could somebody who's studying at the NFTS come and sit in on the scoring session? And the person uh -huh. he brought was Dario, oh, right. okay. <laughs> who already was obviously um, actually quite an established composer. I supervised on a film that Dario was the composer, where we didn't represent him. Uh, yeah. I Capture the Castle. Okay. Um, and I, I was the music supervisor uh, on that film. And then a couple of years later, Dario phoned me up and said, could he come and see me? And he was just at the point where there was two films that he was working on. Both of them were potentially, you know, going to need a lot of resource and a lot of um, organising. Because yeah. one had a very sliding schedule and um, and uh, so, from that point onwards, we we worked yeah. together. So great, yeah. yeah. And then uh, there's an Oscar somewhere in the middle of all that, wasn't yes. there? Yeah. <laughs> for atonement. Yeah. Yes, yeah. which was great. So fantastic. Um, and it's uh, I, I love working with Dario. Yeah. It's, so I've I've worked on all the films with him since since then. Returning to the idea of technology, big studios like the one we're in. We hear a lot about how the landscape has changed there, and there are very, there are very much fewer of them. Uh, how does that feel? You've watched a, a really changing industry, I guess. I have. I mean, when I first started with Air Adele, um, there were there, were, there was probably fifteen studios in West One. Um, some were smaller, some were larger, but of that fifteen, you probably there were at least six that you could do a band in, um, yeah. maybe more than that. And one by one, they've closed for various different reasons. Okay. I think we're the remaining studio in West One where you can do an, an orchestral group, yeah. um, sort of reasonable size. Um, obviously not as large as Abbey Road or Air <laughs> by any right. means. Technology has changed so much. So for composers, uh, many of them now have their own home studios. Mm. And that's driven because they have to be able to do good demos yeah. and you can't afford to go into a studio all the time to do demos. So one thing has driven the other thing and, and it's partly budgets too. Yeah. There aren't, you know, because there's now other ways in which to record music, um, budgets sometimes drive things down so much that it's, you know, there aren't as many live musician and, um, and vocal sessions going on that there used to be. So. It, I mentioned earlier about commercials. When we had our demo studio in Eastbourne Muse, we generally had we had a, an engineer who worked for us freelance, but he was there more or less every day, yeah. all day. Yeah. And it was very rare that we didn't have a session which had vocals on it nearly every day. Wow! And nice. the same with a drummer coming in. Yeah. Because there wasn't program percussion in those days. It, th because every demo that was being done on commercials had a had some form of live element to it, whether it was a vocalist yeah. or keyboard parts being put down or 
um, rhythm section. And you know, it may be that the drummer came in and then the composer played a bit of bass themselves. I mean, our demo studio had a Fender Rhodes. It had a, we had our own bass, we had our own drum kit, we had some early Moog synths, um, and we obviously had a vocal booth. Yeah. So you know, one person might need a drummer to come in and help him on that, but then he, pl he or she played everything else themselves. Yeah. And then we had a, a vocalist who came in an hour later and, and put down the demo vocal. Um, so, in terms of the amount of work that the work w was, it wasn't going to be work that all ended up by getting aired, but it was absolutely driving a business. And yeah. um, in terms of the, for the recording studios, that was happening all across town. So now, without that amount of, of demo work, and which led, of course, to final recordings being done also with live elements. Um, you know the number of commercials now which have original music on um, that's dropped that's yeah, very diff different from how it was yeah. 20 years ago um, and uh, so for the studios it's been very very tough yeah, um, yeah very tough does that make it more rare to find something genuinely sort of exploratory and experimental happening in these studios because everything needs to be so safe now if you're going to spend that money often that money isn't there in the first place but does that mean you're only doing, if you like, sort of just the very safest, high quality score recordings here? Or? Um, possibly true, actually. I mean, yeah. I, we do, there are some composers who, who we know well who will come in and, and try something out. Yeah, um, yeah. But generally people uh, are coming in to do their final recording when you know, a demo's been approved. Yeah. Um, and no more know, booby traps to go. Sort of exactly. Thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When it comes to the the thorny area of of maintaining royalties and collections on, on music, how are we doing with with that in the online world and and keeping an eye on that? Because it's, you know, it's amazing how the internet has created the impression that many things that used to be valued and paid for are, should now be either very cheap or free. Mm. Um, I wouldn't call it a, a, a war or a battle, but it, how is that going and, and are we any closer to being able to collect royalties for music online in a more useful way? Um, yes, we're, we're getting there, but we're still, we've still got a long way to go. Certain countries are, are far ahead of other countries in terms of ensuring that the copyright is paid for in the correct way. Yeah. Um, and the right people are getting the money, so th you know certain countries leave a lot to be desired, and but that's about their fundamental understanding of copyright. You know, yeah. if you like the, the countries that do understand copyright, ensuring that online does get the right the right amount of money paid, and that you know, it's very difficult because people see new technology coming in and believe that there will be you know there doesn't need to be quite so much paid or don't, yeah. don't think that actually you need to pay anything at all but if nothing's paid at all then there won't be people entering the business of creating things because that's the no. only way they're going to make their living it's a battle that's been slowly won but really, yeah. i think it's quite worrying how long it's taken to get to where we are now and if yeah. as as technology develops if we carry on taking so long to get to these points then we, we lose ground yeah and the value of these things gets knocked and knocked yeah. and knocked yeah I suppose sometimes in other industries say like an animator or something it's quite hard to explain to them the importance of royalties and, and do you find yourself having to explain that to people and, and all going the time. through so it's still a kind of it's still people scratch their heads and why do musicians get this extra payment is that the kind of y conversation yes I mean it, it there is just a lack of understanding of, I think there's a lack of understanding that composers are freelance and that nobody's saying at the end of each week, here's your paycheck. Their paycheck only comes when you have a successful piece of music that's being used and they collect royalties from it. So yeah. they're taking a huge chance on the success of whether it's a film or a commercial or a single, they're, they're making an investment of their time. and. The only way they're going to get that investment back is when something's successful and there is a sort of an equitable income stream from it. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think that's, that's really not understood by the general public. I, I, yeah. you know, the trouble is the general public 
tend to think that everybody is a superstar and therefore everyone has got a really nice income out of the business. Yeah. And they don't see the hundreds and hundreds or thousands of people who are trying to make it as singer-songwriters, whom um, you know, th they're, they're investing in their future, but yeah. if they don't get their money from a stream or a download, then they're not going to be able to continue to even try and be a singer-songwriter. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like, you know, the sort of when you see stories of people earning large amounts of money by being a YouTube sort of sensation, they are just this absolutely tiny fraction yeah. of the people. Everyone else is getting almost nothing, even if they're possibly quite well viewed, you know. Yes. You're a, a, a great exponent of, of UK orchestras and playing and, and of the studios here. Um, you know, without, without inviting you to be <laughs> fiercely nationalistic, is there something about the DNA of our players and our industry and how it's grown up that is special to you? Well, I think what makes it so special is that the UK have been a centre of orchestral playing for so many years. I mean, across the UK, we have 12, 15 symphony orchestras, something yeah. like I mean, that's just extraordinary for a country of our size. Yeah, and yeah. when you think that, you know, London has, I think, six symphony orchestras. Yeah. And cons or or um, chamber orchestras permanently, not not ad hoc, but yeah. permanent orchestras. And it's just, there is a huge amount in the DNA. There's a, a lot in the way that um, our academies teach as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we've got you know, four major academies in London, conservatoires. Yeah. I mean, fantastic. Yeah. And all yeah. producing fantastic musicians. So, um, and also most musicians are blessed with having good quality instruments as well yeah. to play on. So therefore, the sound that's produced is the very, very best. And then you couple that with fantastic recording facilities, yeah. and suddenly, you know, y you've, got, you've got what it takes to put all the ingredients together. Yeah. The players in the UK, I think without exception, love what they're doing. They love the fact that they're making music all the time. Yeah. Um, and it's never oh my goodness, this is a day's work and I'm not going to enjoy it. So every session you do with musicians in London, they, they bring a really nice quality of vibe to it. Yeah. When you consider they come into the studio, they've never seen the music before, yeah. and then they give you a performance for yeah. a second take, you know, it's got, wow, that's yeah. an amazing level of a really high quality workmanship. Yeah, and of course, we're, I mean, we shouldn't neglect the great choral tradition as well that no. we have, which uh, I know you, you know, you sang, didn't you, or maybe yep. still do, um, and you've used choirs in, in your scores too. Again, are you drawing on a great tradition when you do that here? Yes. Yeah, I mean, you've got, you've got really sort of star quality people that you can work with right across yeah. musicians, singers, you know, all percussionists. I mean, it, it, what city has got rhythm sections that you know, in some other countries, any one of those people would be held up as the absolute star, and here they're competing against each other. Yeah, yeah. You know, fantastic kit players and yeah. and bass players. I mean, it, it's a very, very rich um, history that yeah. that they pull on as well. And the younger ones coming in, of course, are learning and seeing the older players at that level. It gives you a, a pretty high benchmark all the yeah. time. Rather like the film industry gets slightly atomized, and you'll, you suddenly find a, c a certain city is suddenly quite cheap to film in, or whatever. Or, and as you've already touched on, some of the jobs can now get through technology sent around the globe. Mm. I suppose that becomes this local tradition comes something to to fight for and, and cherish. Yes, I, I mean it does, and I think the other thing that's really important as well is that uh, I, I think for it, it, it's always great when you can bring the orchestra together, but you can also have the production team there as well. Yeah. So, you, you know, the director, producer get to see the music being created. And, but no one wants to sit there where you're, where you're sort of what we call note bashing. Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so therefore, you know, in London, you can say to the director and producer, come along to the sessions, you know, y you'll, you'll sit down, you'll be wild at what you hear. If yeah. there is something that you want to make a comment or make a, you know, a note about, you know, the musicians here take on notes so yeah. fast. So right. you can make a change and you can, you can have an input and it, it's, it, it just makes for really good quality music. Yeah. Um, you must, over the years, you must have witnessed a composer 
kind of getting that first experience of, of an amazing oh, yeah. band playing their stuff. It must be quite a magical moment. It is. Actually, to be honest, the beginning of every session always sends a tingle down my back because there's something extremely special yeah. about, you know, you've put, you've seen the music on the stands. Y you may have heard the demos, or I will have heard the demos, yeah. you know, and you know that, you know essentially what the music's going to be. But then when you hear it played f live, it, it, there is, it, there's just an element of going, wow, yeah. that's, <laughs> you know, that's all come together. <laughs> it <feels like> <laughs> and it sounds brilliant. Yeah. yeah just talk to me a little bit about how your work with Patrick Doyle came about because just because I know that you've you were with him from the start sort of thing and it's nice to just hear the story of, of how he progressed. <laughs> Patrick uh, who had studied music at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama was working with Kenneth Branagh on his theatre season and the company were touring and had um, a number of Shakespeare plays in rep and Patrick appeared in some of them he was also right. the uh, he was Balthazar. <laughs> he w was he he also uh, was the in the composer, and he was playing all the instruments that there were to play as part of the music. It was all it was a one man band. It was Patrick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Ken started prepping Henry V, and Patrick said to him that he really, really wanted to have an opportunity to write the score, and so he did do a demo because. Ken had to show the producers that Pat was going to be able to write the score. Yeah. Around the same time, I was introduced through another of our composers to a wonderful orchestrator called Larry Ashmore. And when Pat was doing the demo, again, Brian Gascoigne figures in this story. Uh, okay. yeah. um, Brian Gascoigne um, was one of the first exponents of, fair, of a, with a fair light. Oh, wow. yeah. And so they were going to do the demo using a fair light. And Brian met Patrick and he said, oh, you need to have an orchestrator. I'll introduce you to Larry. They'd done the demo. He had taken it to the producer. Larry said to Patrick, what you need is an agent. I said, I'd love to meet Patrick, but I'd love to hear some of his music. So he sent me the demo, which was just fantastic. So I started representing yeah. Patrick then. And um, I don't know how many films you've done with him, but there are lots, aren't there? Yes. The, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, which has been fantastic. It's yeah. a, amazing to work with Patrick, and uh, um, it, we always have a lot of fun as well along the way. Excellent. But um, yes, yeah, so I mean, Henry V is many years ago, and then I've worked with him with um, Kenneth Branagh on all of his uh, films, and now working on the theatre season as well, where Patrick's writing the oh, music. Right. Amazing. Um, and uh, plus, obviously, all the other films that yeah. Patrick's done with, you know, wonderful directors like Brian De Palma and, and Regis Vanier, who he's worked on with several films. Yeah, um, yeah. You're sometimes described as a, as a gatekeeper for composers who who want to find their way into uh, film and television composing. That's that's quite a scary concept. Do you feel like that? Oh, it's just scary. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I always say to composers that it's very important that in working with a composer we have a lot of trust and a, a very open relationship because there are times when there may be things that you know we absolutely want to try and achieve for the composer but for whatever reason can't and equally yeah. there are times when we might have a project and the composer says I don't want to do it so no, I'm not feeling it, <laughs> I'm not yeah, feeling it. Yeah. so you it has to be a very open relationship. I mean, w w over the years, we have represented a number of composers who are starting out in their careers, um, and it's been fantastic to see how a, a composer develops, yeah. how they um, how they get the next project, and that leads on to the next project. Yeah. But it's very much teamwork because it's both to the composer and to us, it's everyone working together that achieves those things yeah. and taking the opportunities when they arise. Yes, we can help try and make sure those opportunities are there, um, but it's absolutely incumbent on the composer yeah. to take them up. You can lead um, them, but ultimately there they are having yes, to and, and put the dots down. And, and it is exciting when you see a composer you know, who's not very well known but then becomes very well known at the other yeah. end. That, that's 
f fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Maggie, it's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you for Thank lifting you the lid on, on some of the music supervisor's role. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheers.